All right, welcome everyone to the Friday Tech Talk, and we have a great Tech Talk lined up for you today. Today's speaker is Dusty Zoland, and he is a Tech Academy graduate. He graduated in 2021. And today's talk is uh, called Continuous Learning, uh, keeping up your skill, keeping your skills relevant in a fast paced in the fast paced tech industry. Uh, in this talk, Justin will cover mastering the art of continuous learning. You will find out how to learn fast and stay ahead. You will uh, also learn how to future proof your skills in the ever changing tech industry, and you will learn how to adapt, which is really important. Uh, adapt with embracing new technologies and trends. Well, without further ado, uh, Dusty, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you so much. And hello, everybody. I am Dusty. I, yeah, I'm hoping I'll be able to help you all out today. So let me go ahead and get things going. So things that I want to talk about is why continuous learning is important, different ways to learn, asking questions and reinforcing knowledge. So I'm gonna be talking about a whole slew of things related to these points, but just to give you guys an overview, this is what we'll start with. So who am I? So I'm Justin, but I go by Dusty. I was a UCLA alum back in 2013, and I actually started in psychology. I took on a variety of jobs. I had about five different jobs in the past year, and I would switch around between a lot of things. I would be hired for human resources, and they would say, hey, Dusty, we need somebody to do a data entry. Can you do data entry for us? So I would go and do data entry, and they would be like, hey, Dusty, we need somebody to do contracts for us. Can you learn how to read and do some contracting for us? So I would do contracts. So I was switching around constantly because depending on the businesses that I joined, there was always different needs for what was going on. One of the things that I learned over the years is that I got to learn how to learn or I'm going to have some trouble because everything would always be different depending on the role I would hop in. And yet all these times when I did HR, when I did data entry, and when I switched to payroll, I'm like, man, I really feel like there should be a better way to do these things. I'm doing one by one. I'm doing manual. I feel like there's got to be some automation or something to make it better. I have two older brothers. One was a philosophy major, another was a psychology major, and both of them actually switched over to the tech industry and they're like, hey, Dusty, maybe you should check out tech. And I was always like, eh, it sounds like fun, sounds interesting, but it's quite a big jump to make. So back in 2020, when the pandemic had struck, it was the height of COVID, I ended up getting furloughed from my latest job, which was a admin assistant for an oil refinery company. And I had all the time in the world. I'm like, you know, I'm out of the job right now. I've always heard about tech and it seems interesting. Maybe it's the time to pick up something new and learn something new. So I did a lot of research and there was something that was really interesting to me, which was Unity, which was a video game development software at the time. I'm like, okay, if I want to learn Unity, what do I need to know? And I saw that C Sharp was a big thing. I was like, okay, who will teach me C Sharp? And I found the Tech Academy. So I was like, oh, this seems like a good idea. So I ran through the Tech Academy program. I graduated in 2021, followed all their requ or recommendations for searching for a job. And I was hired as a software developer for CBRE, which is Coldwell Banker Roth Ellis. It's a, it's a really big real estate company. And that was quite an experience. And two years later, I'm finding myself as a senior software engineer. And I think it's pretty full circle. The first job that I had as PYG senior software engineer, PYG is places you'll go. They wanted me to design a payroll system actually. And they're like, Dusty, we need to make this a little bit faster. We have somebody manually entering all this stuff into ADP right now. Can you learn a way to make this go? So I was like, okay. So I put the old knowledge and I learned all about the tech stuff. And I fused my tech knowledge with my previous payroll knowledge, put it together. And within a month or two, we had a new payroll system out and going, and it changed the process down from a week of entering to five minutes, which is crazy. Always blows my mind what you can do with tech. So I personally value continuous learning because it's something you always have to do on the job. There's always going to be new things. You always got to learn. So I'm going to hammer on that a little bit more. But if you, excuse me, 
Other things about me, I'm a huge nerd. You'll see in the picture that I am playing a board game. It's called Wingspan, if anybody knows it. I'm there with my wife and my mother-in-law. It's a very fun board game. If you haven't heard of it, I recommend giving it a go. It's a good stuff. And also, I like to tell a lot of stories. As you can probably tell, I like to talk about my past experiences with some stories. So I'll be going further on those as we talk about the boards. So why is continuous learning important? I believe that learning the why versus the how makes it so that you can keep on growing and keep on learning. Knowing the how is important for how things get done, but the why will help you grow. Back at UCLA, I had a manager named Scott, and he told me a story about two different groups of software engineers that he had gone to college with. The first one, the first group was wicked smart. They would be able to look at something, pick it up, find out the how, and they learned the how for the latest and greatest technology. This other group was also very smart, but they were a bit slower. They tried to understand why things were done the way they were, rather than just the how. Admittedly, the first group produced better results for the technology at the time. The second group still produced good results, but they were a little bit slower initially. What ended up happening was that as time changes, do tech changes as well. The first group had a harder time adapting to any new tech that would pop up, and as a result, their progress would slow. The second group, focusing on the why and understanding why things were done the way they were, they maintained that constant high pace. It wasn't as high as the specialists initially, but they were constantly doing well, and they understood the why, and they were able to pick up things from a newer technology faster. And that hammers into the second point. Tech is constantly changing as we go out through the year. Things that were relevant five years ago, not as relevant, it just changes so quickly. And there's always, always new things to learn. Even at CVRA, when I started, we had a package management system called JFrog that was quite good, but it was a little bit of a pain to coordinate credentials with it for our company. When I moved over to PYG, I was like, there's got to be a better way to deal with these packages and grabbing them. And my brother had mentioned, hey, have you heard of GitHub Actions? It's kind of a new technology or a new thing. It's connected to Microsoft. It helps for package management. And you can do a whole bunch of things for CI, CD pipelines. And I was like, that sounds kind of interesting. So I did some research. I talked it out. I presented it to my team. And we integrated it. And it was great. And I was like, oh. Shoot, it's good to learn and stay on top of this new technology. Got to do the research, find out something new that comes along, makes the process better. And then finally, every business you go to will have a different way of doing things. This, this can be a point of frustration at some times because you'll go to a place and you'll be like, I don't think that's the best solution, but that doesn't matter. A lot of systems are built on legacy systems and solutions. You have to work what, with what you're given. So you'll find out that a lot of the times the small businesses have to do impromptu fixes. Stakeholders ask for something within a few weeks. They build something, and it's good at the time. It's not exactly a scalable solution. What will happen is the company grows. They have success. It still kind of works but you kind of have to start tuning things to make it fit a little better. And then it gets a little messier as time goes on. So even if it's not the best thing, sometimes you have to find out what works at the time and what the business has, and you have to build off of that. So no matter what you go, you have to be flexible and learn how to learn what the business does. Business knowledge was always a big thing for all the places that I went to. So now with that, I want to emphasize it's OK to not know everything. As, as software developers, we always talk about imposter syndrome. It is very real. I very much relate to it. The first time I, well, not stepped into CBRA, but I was at my keyboard for CBRA, I thought, holy cannoli, what am I doing here? I'm just some guy that got hired for a tech job. I don't know what I'm doing. I, I shouldn't be here, but it was OK. I did know stuff. I just didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know how the business would be, but I was there to learn. And learning how to learn was such a big thing. There's a quote from a guy, Socrates, 
that says, I know that I don't know everything, or roughly translated. It's okay to know that you don't know everything, and the further into a topic you go, the more you realize how little you know. But that's okay. I want to emphasize that's okay. You'll be able to learn and pick it up as you go along, and learning how to learn, again, I'm going to emphasize that, learning how to learn the new stuff is really important for any place you go. So different ways to learn. There's four standard things that you can do. So we have visualizing, talking, reading, practicing. These are all things you probably heard of before. But for visualizing, there's videos that you can watch to pick up on things. And there's also a tool called draw.io. Draw.io is a favorite of mine. It's a basically a live spreadsheet or a live graph designer. Whenever you're talking about a concept, you can make little boxes, fill them out, connect them. It's great for visualizing how a system can work. So another thing is discussion, just talking it out, talk with a manager, find out the requirements, try to figure out what's going on. Then reading, this one is pretty standard. We do a lot of reading, especially online. Anytime you Google something, you're reading it out. An important thing is that if you encounter any new technology, I would recommend going slow. Sometimes we want to rush and read right through the manual, but taking it step by step through the manual, there's a concept my boss used to say, which is RTFM, read the manual. <laughs> and that is a big thing. Sometimes we're trying to go too fast to meet requirements. If you take a slow step, read through what the documentation has, it'll really help you out. And then finally, I personally believe putting things that you learned into practice is one of the best ways. You'll have a discussion, you'll watch a video, but if you don't actually reinforce it by trying to do what they were talking about or putting the concept into practice, it won't stick as well. So when they have the videos and they say, hey, follow along, do this on your computer, highly, highly recommend doing such a thing. It sounds simple, but it is a very good tool for reinforcement. So most common way to find resources as tech people, we have Googling. So I will say AI is becoming more common, but I will give the caveat, AI can be a bold-faced liar. So there's too many times where you'll ask ChatGPT or Microsoft Copilot a question, and they'll give you an answer that is completely wrong, and you'll just be like, why'd you answer that way? There's a little prompt that was had where somebody asked a AI to draw a picture of a cheeseburger without the cheese. And they return, the AI returned a picture, and it was a cheeseburger with cheese. And the prompter was like, excuse me, I said I wanted a cheeseburger without cheese. And the AI said, there's no cheese, that's just mustard. <laughs> and it was such a silly little thing, but it was clearly cheese. The story is a little silly, but even on some tech questions, I have asked AI, hey, do you have any ideas for how to do this? And it'll give me something that is completely off the base. Asking AI is a good resource to get started, but please do not rely on it solely. If you understand the why behind the code that the AI is spitting out, why it's trying to spit out such a thing, that'll help for your own stuff and be able to put it into practice. And please do not put code directly from AI into production that can cause issues too. That's a different story though. So. As you're researching and Googling, there's going to be hundreds and hundreds of resources that you encounter. I believe it's important to learn how to ask the right questions so you save time and effort while looking things up. So I believe software development is all about asking the right questions. I talked about saving time and effort, but one of the stories that comes to mind is that there's an old myth story about a knight of King Arthur called Percival. Percival was a dude that was chilling in the forest, and he saw a procession of knights going by, and he's like, yo, those knights look really cool. I want to become a knight. So he ended up becoming a knight. He trained under them, and he set out for what all King Arthur knights do. He was looking for the Holy Grail. So there's the story of Percival where he's on a journey to go back home, see his mom, and he encounters a man fishing in a boat, who is the Fisher King, who is related to the Holy Grail. And this king's like, let me take you back to my castle. And as Percival goes to the castle, 
he's eating food. And what happens is that there's this procession of people that comes by. They're holding a bleeding lance, a silver candelabra, and the Holy Grail itself. And the whole time, Percival's thinking, hmm, this is kind of weird. I don't really know what's going on. But Percival was taught that you don't want to ask questions to look dumb. And Percival was like, okay, I've been trained not to ask these questions. Let me stay silent. I'll try to figure it out later. What happens is the next day, Percival wakes up, the king is gone. The procession is gone, the castle's abandoned. He thinks this is really strange. And he goes out into the forest and this woman admonishes him and she's like, Percival, you were supposed to ask the healing question. If you did, you would have found the Holy Grail and this whole King Arthur Knight stuff would have been great. So Percival, who was taught not to ask these questions, ended up screwing up and unfortunately had to spend a few more years questing for the Holy Grail. In the end, Percival learns to ask the healing question and receives the grail from the Fisher King, and things work out. It's a silly little story, but it sticks in my mind that it's always better to ask the questions and try to find out what's going on and why, rather than just staying ignorant. There's too many times in my meetings that somebody will have a clear look of confusion on their face, and somebody will ask them, do you understand? And they'll just go, uh, yes. <laughs> and it's... It's clear that they don't, but that is supposed to be the time that you're asking questions. There is a respectful way to do it, but please, I will say asking the right questions to learn more is such an important part of growth and development. Do not be afraid to ask the questions and look dumb. You'll look dumb at the time, but you'll grow in knowledge and things will be better for the future. Too many times I've done requirements gathering and I made an assumption required regarding what a client wanted. And we had two different views. If I just asked some basic questions, I could have established the same page and we would have gone from there. I've gotten better about it now, but sometimes you're just like, oh, I need to establish the same page. Let me ask some of these simple questions that may or may not be so simple actually. So, no. My preferred method for asking good questions. One of my favorite Stack Overflow posts had a four point suggestion for how to ask a good question. You gotta ask, what am I trying to do? So what am I setting out to accomplish? What am I trying to code? The next, it's kind of like the scientific method. You ask yourself, what have I done? You want to see what the results of what you've done. So you'll ask, what did I expect? And what actually happened. So if you're trying to debug something and you're trying to serialize a JSON and you take it in, but it's not spitting out the JSON for whatever reason, you expected a JSON, you got an error message instead, let me read through the error message. Trying to work with a dictionary, it doesn't find a key. I expected the key to be found. Why isn't the key in there? So for these more, these are very, very simple examples. But learning how to ask these questions is huge. So many times I get stuck on debugging and I'll try to do something and it looks like it should work and then it doesn't. So I'll have to go through my mind. Okay, I was trying to do X. I expected Y, but I got Z instead. As I'm even typing this out, my brain's like, that's what I missed. And that will get me to find the right solution. So learning how to ask those questions and testing yourself with those questions is huge. Also, if you ask for help from a senior or anybody else, please make sure you phrase these questions appropriately too. There were two coworkers I had at a previous job and they were both incredibly talented and incredibly smart, but they would have frustrations with each other because one coworker would get stuck and he would ask the second coworker, how do I do this? And that's, not the best of questions because it doesn't show what he was trying to do or what what he was aiming for. So the first coworker would be like, what have you tried? What are you doing? What happened? And that would always get the second coworker to be like, okay, let me try doing this. But please, asking questions is good. Make sure you ask those right questions and please be respectful to anybody that you ask questions to. So, 
every now and then, even when you're asking questions, things are not going to be clear. You're going to be stuck on something, you're going to be debugging, and you're going to be like, I tried, I'm asking what it's supposed to be doing, it's not making any sense, what can I do to resolve the issue? So I have three things that I highly recommend that will help you for asking the questions and keep you learning. First is to take a deep breath. I believe it is very important to step back and take a breath. Sometimes you got to slow down because you're so in the mode that you don't even realize what's going on. Back in college, I had to read this book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. And the whole premise of the book is that zebras, they're a prey animal. They're hunted by a lot of things and they're stressed but they don't get ulcers. Humans, on the other hand, we're, we're a constant victim of ulcers. Why is it that zebras versus humans don't get ulcers? So the book walks through the parasympathetic, parasympathetic nervous system and it talks about the fight or flight response that you may or may not have heard of. But it's basically, when we encounter stressors in our life, our body reacts and it's supposed to help us at the time. Stress is an evolutionary reaction that says, okay, something bad is happening right now. Let me get away from this situation. For the case of a zebra, I'm being hunted. I get stressed. I run really fast and I survive or I don't. But the stress is supposed to help at the time. Issue is with humans, we can't run away from our stressors sometimes. If there's the stress of jobs and we're not figuring things out or financial, the stress will constantly loom. And the signal will keep on firing in our brain, hey, you got to do something. You got to do something. You will get stressed, but you can't run away from the stressor, which will wear and tear on you, which is not good. So sometimes taking a deep breath and taking a step back will help. This also relates to another study. Sorry, I went to college for psych, so I like throwing this in a little bit. There were two doctors, Dr. Lieberman and Dr. Eisenberger, and they talked about this thing called the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. And there's a whole abstract on it. It's super fascinating. I would recommend reading it. But they basically did fMRIs, magnetic resonance imaging. And they noticed that when people were having fears or stresses in the amygdala, which is basically the fear center, was acting up. If they verbalized the emotions that they were feeling and they talked it out, the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex would start flaring up. And they found an inverse correlation, AKA when people talked out what they were feeling and their emotions and their stresses, the right ventrolateral prefrontal cortex would start firing more. And as a result, the amygdala, kind of like the fear center, would start firing less and people would be able to better control what is going on. So if you get stuck, if you get stressed, take a deep breath, talk it out, and then go on a walk. This is not relevant for everybody, but I'm a huge fan of walking. It's a good way to change up your environment and get different ideas going. If you stay in the same place too long, your ideas may stagnate a little bit. I strongly believe in environmental refreshing. You need to step away from your usual work spot to get more ideas going sometimes. The thing is, a lot of us are very based off of contextual clues. You may have heard of Pavlov's dogs with the bell ringing and then the dogs barking because they know the food's coming. Sometimes the same visuals can work on humans as well. If we're just sitting at our desk, we always associate desk with work. Sometimes you need to switch up your environment and get your brain processing a different way. So just taking a step back, either taking a walk or stepping away from your desk can do wonders when working on a problem. And then last but not least is the rubber duck method. Y'all may have heard of this before, but just talking about your problems to a rubber duck can do wonders. You don't have to have a rubber duck. Rubber duck. It could just be anybody. I tend to go on walks with my wife and I'll be like, okay, I've encountered a problem at work. I'm doing X, I expected Y, but I got Z. And just even talking it out with her, it'll flash in my brain, oh, maybe I should do this. And that will usually give me another clue. So again, take a deep breath, step away from your desk, talk it out. It'll help make you unstuck. 
and it'll help you keep on learning. Now, other things. How do you remember what you've learned? So if you've gone through all these processes, you've asked the questions, you're learning new stuff, how do you get it to stick in your brain? So repetition is one of the biggest keys for reinforcement. It's it can be a little boring to talk about the same stuff that you've already talked about, but it is highly important for getting it stuck in your brain and getting that reinforcement. I had a teacher named Dr. Franslow back at UCLA. The story is entirely anecdotal, but he recommended the 333 rule. He said, review things in three minutes, three hours, and three days. So after you finish a lesson, three minutes after, reinforce what you've learned, talk it out, reinforce it, write it down. Do something like that. Three hours later, do the same thing. And then three days later, you do the same thing again. Following those three steps of 333 can help things stick in your brain a little bit better. Now, I know that's not going to be the case for everybody. It'll be, it'll be helpful for some people, though. Just know that everybody learns in a different way. So you got to find out what's best for you for learning and getting things to be reinforced. My personal favorite actually is to recap a meeting. So it sounds a little silly, but we'll have a meeting and I'll be the guy writing notes or taking notes at the end of it. And then I'll say, okay, in this meeting, we discussed X, Y, and Z. Is everybody on the same page? Does anybody have any questions? This helps not only you learn it because you're talking about what you did and it helps to reinforce it that way, but it makes sure that everybody sees the same page and anybody that has any questions or confusion that they didn't ask will also know at that point too. So recapping a meeting, just even writing notes at the end, all are super duper important for reinforcement, would highly recommend doing such things. Okay, and then I personally believe the best reinforcement is to practice what you've done. So again, we talked about watching videos and practicing and all that stuff, but it's good to actually put what you learn into what you do. It sounds simple, it sounds silly, but too many times people read and not actually do what they do. So highly recommend, excuse me, I highly recommend when you learn about something, you code it out, and then for the three minutes after, I recommend writing down those comments I do a lot of XML commenting on my functions. If I write in a, if I write a function and my other software developer doesn't know what's going on, I'll write out this comment at the top that says, okay, this function intends to do this. Here are the parameters and here is the expected result. So having those comments, writing them out is huge. It'll help your other software developers when they come read your code, and it'll also help you in the future. It sounds silly, but I've coded stuff that I've looked at six months ago, and I'm like, what was I trying to do with this? Because we've written a lot of code. And I'll look through the comments and the documentation and be like, oh, I remember better now. It's all ringing a bell. So writing those comments, writing that documentation is a huge help. Far too often these days, you'll see functions that have no documentation. And that makes it so hard to understand what it's doing. So if anything, please, please, please write comments in your code, save that documentation. It'll help yourself and it'll help others for the future. And I personally believe one of the best ways to reinforce is through passion projects. So I had mentioned before that I had joined the Tech Academy because I was looking into C Sharp for Unity. And after I had gone through the Tech Academy, I was actually asked by two very good friends to be the host of their bachelorette party. This is one of my favorite stories. But as a result, excuse me, as a result of the Tech Academy, I was like, okay, how can I make this bachelor party, bachelorette party interesting for them? These two friends are huge Dungeons and Dragons fans. And they are also huge Monster Hunter fans, if anybody has heard of that franchise. So I was like, okay, how could I incorporate Dungeons and Dragons into Monster Hunter? What I ended up doing was that I looked for resources that would work for Dungeons and Dragons. And there was this website called Roll20, which is great for playing Dungeons and Dragons online, which was during the times of COVID. So I looked it up, I read through the APIs, 
and I designed enemies in this Dungeons and Dragons game that were based off of Monster Hunter monsters. And admittedly, this was straight out of the Tech Academy. I was still very raw with my skills, so I coded some monsters. I put all the code on my GitHub, like the Tech Academy suggested. And I also posted it on my personal website, which was also what the Tech Academy had suggested. I had been applying to quite a few jobs, and I got a call back from one job that I was super underqualified for. And this guy, Solomon, he's like, hey, Dusty, can I talk to you? I want to interview you. And I was like, sure, why not? <laughs> so I did an interview with him. It ended up working out. And I ended up getting hired. And Solomon told me, Dusty, we hired you out of all the candidates. And you even beat some master's candidates. Do you know why? And I'm like, no, I have no idea. Why'd you guys hire me? <laughs> so Solomon explained that one of the other developers on the team was browsing through all the resumes. And even though I was clearly underqualified for the position, this guy was also a Dungeons and Dragons fan. And he saw on my personal website that I had started developing a D&D &D project. And he's like, Solomon, we got to talk to this guy now. He's a huge nerd. So Solomon was like, OK, let's go ahead and talk to this guy. And they saw that I had incorporated what I had learned from the Tech Academy into what I was practicing. That fusion of passion with tech and nerdiness helped to continuously grow my skills. Admittedly, when I look back at the project now, I'm like, oh, wow, I could have done a lot better on that. But it was enough to show that, hey, this guy is interested in still learning, and he can pick up new things. And that's why we want to talk to him. So I am forever grateful that DD actually was responsible for getting me, out, getting me my first tech job. So I really want to emphasize if something's interesting to you and you put it into practice, it'll really help stick and it'll show others that you're really trying to learn. So with that, I have reached the end of my presentation. Thank you everybody for listening. Please let me know if you have any questions. Oh, also, that is my personal email address. If there are any questions that come up that you don't want to ask here or just any thoughts about the industry, I know I am a relatively fresh student myself. I've only been out of the Tech Academy for three years. But if you want to ask about my experiences, please feel free to send me an email. I will typically respond on weekends, but I want to share and give back the luckiness and the blessings that I've received. So please feel free to reach out to me if you have any questions. And with that, thank you so much for listening. Yeah, Dusty, that was a uh, really good talk. And uh, you do like to tell stories. <laughs> and you're very, you're very passionate about your stories and, and the tech industry. So that's, uh, that's awesome. Uh, really, no, really good. Um, so it's not really, I mean, learning is near and dear, near and dear to me. And I think the ongoing learning, uh, it's kind of what what I really enjoy in life is continued learning, be it tech or be it other other um, aspects of just you know what life is and what uh, you know just science in general. I guess is, is a good way to put it. Um, what are uh, what are some of the things or the resources you use for um, sharpening your tech skills? Like there's Leak Code out there. There's the different code challenge websites. There's YouTube channels. What are some of your favorites for ongoing learning? OK, so my top three, there is lead code. As you mentioned, that's a good way to check some skills. And it's a great way to practice. You can see compare. That is a great resource. My second is Stack Overflow. <laughs> it's a very common developer's question for them. But just being able to scour through that and being able to find those resources, other people that have similar experiences and finding solutions is great. I do caveat that, though. Please make sure you check the dates and the versioning of things that they used. Sometimes you'll find Stack Overflow questions that are back from 2008, 2009, not as relevant for some of the technology today. And then three is relying on my manager or my seniors. So back at CBRE, I, of course, was fresh but I had a senior that knew a lot more. So learning to ask those questions to the senior 
was one of my greatest resources. I know not everybody will have access to a senior that would be experienced in some of these fields, but if you do, please learn how to ask those questions to them. And I will emphasize that soft skills are very important for talking with them. I've had uh, comments from UI UX designers, my wife's a UI UX designer, and a few other friends. And they mentioned that sometimes when they talk with other tech people, they can be a little, how do you say it? A little curt or rude when things need to change. When you're asking these questions and learning, it may have to change things. It's okay that it's not perfect the first time. This fits into the agile mindset in Scrum. You're constantly adapting and changing to make things better. So if you're asking questions and somebody says, oh, I think it would be better to do this or if we incorporate this, Please don't get offended, adapt with it, and run with it. No, really good points. And um, it sounds like you and your wife make a uh, really good team. <laughs> she's pretty great. I think she's pretty great. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. What would you say, um, one thing I like to do, I like GitHub and seeing projects on GitHub and, you know, just browsing, you know, usually people I know or people that are, um, friends of who I know. Um, but if you go through and you can look at their projects and look at their readmes and that kind of thing, um, that's that's another really good re a really good resource for learning. Good point. Yeah. And so you uh, incorporated a lot of psychology kind of in your talk with the psychology of learning. Have you ever thought about like maybe writing a book or that kind of thing? Um, not not writing a book, but it's a topic near and dear to my heart. Yeah. I do I do want to incorporate some of my psych stuff into video game development, actually. So that is the plan for, further down the line. Speaking of new technologies, there's something that came out or is gaining popularity called Godot, Godot, whatever you want to call it. But it, it's some of the newest video game technology. And I was like, oh, I want to make a game using some of my psych stuff and my tech stuff to incorporate some of those site concepts to kind of present stories in a different manner than you would originally see. So that is going to be the new passion project that I'm working on for the future. There you go. Well, you can tell you're passionate, passionate about learning, passionate about psychology, passionate about tech. So you can combine those and make a book, Psychology of Learning or Psychology of Learning Tech. Yeah. All right. Um, I just want to let everyone else know that they're welcome to ask questions in the chat here. Um, you can raise your hand. I can unmute your mic if you want to ask a question directly. And um, no, it's been a, a great talk with Dusty. We are really happy with, uh, with his success after graduating. And you say you're new to the tech industry, but it sounds like you're already moving into a senior developer role. Which is uh, which is which is pretty quick for you know two or three years, which is great. Um, could you talk a little bit? Um, well, you you did kind of go over it about how you got hired um, with doing the Dungeon and Dragons and um, you know doing adding some development with that. And I, I think that was a good point you made where you said that um, you made the projects, you were just doing it because you were interested, but then, you know, the, the company that hired you and the people that were there saw what you did. Um, I think that really emphasizes that showcasing your portfolio um, yes. and is it really important. And you said you, you know, put the code up to GitHub. Um, that's really important. So ongoing projects, I think, are a really good learning um, tool um, after you graduate, uh, but they're also great for your portfolio. So it's really going to help you out with, you know, looking for the job that you want and, you know, helping you out throughout your career. So yeah. I think I think that that was a great point. Um, what did you do like right after graduation? What was what were some of the initial steps you took for uh, for looking for work? OK, the initial steps I. I created the portfolio as the Tech Academy had recommended, and I had set up the Google Sheet also as the Tech Academy had recommended for the places that I had applied to when I had last applied any updates or stati of what's going on. After that, I would balance half of my day with looking for new jobs, updating the Google Sheet, 
and the other half with updating my portfolio for anything new that I was developing, including the tech fraud or the D&D uh, &D project that I was working on. So I followed a lot of the recommendations that the Tech Academy had had. I didn't know how effective it was going to be at the time, if I'm being completely honest, and it worked wonders for me. So please, they know what they're talking about. Follow those recommendations is really good. So I also had signed up for a few job hiring websites. I did LinkedIn Premium at the time. There was some promotion, which helped give me views and give me comparisons to what other candidates had. That was one of the job hunting resources I used. But also, I tailored my cover letters to my jobs. I sent out, I want to say, two or 300 resumes within about three months to get hired, also as the Tech Academy had recommended. And then the biggest thing is applying to jobs that I didn't think I was qualified for, because that's what got hired, or that's what happened at CBRE. They always talk about that in the Tech Academy stuff. And I'm like, I feel like this would be a waste of time, but no, please follow them, do it. It works out well. So they know what they're talking about. Please follow their advice. We, uh, we appreciate, um, appreciate the uh, support with that. And we do, uh, we do really care about the students and we care about um, them finding their first job and what goes on after they do find that first job and throughout their career. Once you graduate the Tech Academy, you're always alumni. So it's, uh, you always have our support. All right, and does anyone else have any questions? Now, uh, Kevin or Sheila or Joy, um, do you have anything that you wanna add? All right, um, usually we have uh, Gab here and she uh, talks about next week's talk. I haven't looked at next week's talk. I don't um, I don't know what it is right now, but you can check it out at meetup.com. Oh, there's Gab. I, I am actually here. I've been here. Yeah, I don't I, My apologies, Gab. I, I looked through the list of, of attendees and I didn't see you. Oh, it's because it says outcomes division. That's why. Yeah, I need outcomes. My apologies, Gab. Gab, uh, take it away. All right. So thank you so much, Justin. I really learned a lot with uh, from your text and I do appreciate, I now have deep appreciation for my psychology professor because that's how I, how I was able to like, oh, wow, which one's the amygdala again? It's like, oh, okay. So then somewhere at the back of your head, right? Yeah. And okay, so for the other Tech Talks, we do have other Tech Talks booked for the entire month of October. So it's always at the same time, Friday, 1 p.m. Pacific. So you, you just watch out for the email reminders. And if you wanna like book yourself, book in advance, it's also in our meetup group, the same uh, meetup groups that you were able to reserve into this one on. And then we're also uh, promoting other programs in the Tech Academy. So we have the Accelerator program. If you're an alumni or a current graduate, or a current student rather, uh, you have access to uh, the accelerator program, it's a free three month subscription for all of our students and alumni. We talk about uh, different technologies, uh, advanced, uh, more advanced technologies than what you will learn in, uh, in the bootcamp. And it's a great way to really like hone your skills and like review or review uh, some other skills that you may have forgotten. And then uh, another note is we're actually migrating our from. Uh, into a new Discord server. So if you get a an email telling you that, hey, join this uh, new Tech Academy alumni Discord server, as long as it's from us, uh, you can trust it. And yeah, and we also include it in our alumni newsletter, I believe. So yeah, please join that server too. Yep. All right, good stuff, Gab, thank you. And uh, I want to thank everyone for coming out today, and I uh, want, definitely want to thank Dusty. Uh, that was a that was a great talk. You are very passionate and very enthusiastic about technology and about uh, learning, and it really came across. So we really appreciate that. We would love to have you back sometime. And uh, yeah, congratulations on uh, on your new job, your new career, and how life's going for you. It seems like uh, it's happy times for you. Yes. 
I, I'm, I'm a very, I'm a very lucky fellow. I am very thankful, and thank you so much for having me. It has been yeah. an honor. Yeah, Dusty, really great to have you, and um, yeah, you have uh, have a great weekend, and we will talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Bye, Thanks, everybody. Dusty. Thanks everyone for coming out, and do join us next next week, same time, same channel. Have a great weekend, all. Bye.